Uh, I'm very excited about, about this evening. Um, my name is Jason Jasperson. I'm a, a professor of art here at Bethany Lutheran College. And um, we're dodging around uh, artwork in the middle of the gallery. I hope that, uh, that you can find some sort of a comfortable view. We'll premiere a video, the, the editing of which was finished, I think we could say minutes <laughs> ago, maybe an hour-ish ago. Um, uh, and that's from, that's from uh, Ephraim Pottery. We have with us tonight um, the owner of Ephraim Pottery and the primary potter. And then we also, and that's Kevin Hicks. He's over here, give a wave. And then uh, Leah Purish, also from Ephraim Pottery, a talented painter who became a sculptor and does many other things at the pottery. Um, lean into how this place works. I've, I've um, installed the work over the last couple days and people will stop by and they'll look at the tags and be looking for the name of the artist. Note that that's not present because it's not that simple. It's not that simple. And I think there's, there's something else, something very special going on in uh, the work that you see here. Speaking of the work, understand that uh, the title of the show is um, Ephraim Pottery, 27 years of collaboration and something. What's it say on the sign back there? <laughs> Collaborate, 27 years of collaboration and craftsmanship. Um, so what the work that we have here is a sampling of those 27 years. So you'll notice the date that it was retired. You'll notice on the title card, you'll notice uh, how many were produced in sort of the lifetime of the run of that model, of that piece, and understand that each piece was handcrafted by various people. Uh, no machines, no molds. So they're all one of a kind, but you know, in some cases there's been 142 of one of a kinds. It's a, a fascinating thing. Um, we're gonna roll, uh, roll this video and then uh, we're going to hear from our two guests as moderated by Alyssa Inniger, our head librarian. I think this is gonna be a fun time. Because I started this with the idea that I wanted something that I could do, that I could be a part of, that I could build, that was about a product, but it was also about an artistic identity and it was also about a lifestyle. And that's kind of where Ephraim fits. It's about building something that you can do for your life. I'm Kevin Hicks. I'm a potter sculptor at Ephraim Pottery. I do think that every step along the way, there's been a good life. If you can just, just open your eyes to what's going on in the moment. The time where I was probably making the least amount of money doing what I'm doing and making pottery were some of the best, the struggles, the struggles are the things that really are the fun part. I started the, the business with um, two others. In the beginning, one was more an accountant and another one was a, another artist. And we decided to kind of go into business with this arts and crafts style pottery that with modern craftsmen. And there was a revival going on at the time the forms are reflective of the lifestyle in that they are organic. And yeah, I think the nature influence in the arts and crafts style and therefore in Ephraim is super important. I love getting down into the areas where you're looking closely at, at how amazing nature is and the designs that are already there, that if you just kind of look a little bit closer and then you kind of work with those and try and evolve those into the onto the ceramic form. Um, that is something that is just, it's around us all the time. And so if you just keep your eyes open all the time, you can see how beautiful nature is and how it can be elevated to be onto your ceramic forms that becomes art in people's homes.
typically the number of people that would work on a single pot would be around three people. Now that's the people that just worked on the pot. That doesn't always encompass the full life of that because you have the people that might have been designing the pot. I might design something that someone else might be doing all the craftsmanship work on. We do have some people that are a little bit more on the creative side and then we have some people that are more like, I like to do the crafting of these pieces. At the current time, I would say most people do create at least a little bit, and I encourage that from the beginning. Uh, it wasn't always so much that way. I think that that's something that I've encouraged more as the pottery has gone on to try and get people to contribute. I, I think one of the things that we do here to hopefully um, nurture people feeling that the work is important to them is steer the work that they have to be more of what they enjoy doing. And so we're not trying to make people what we are. We're trying to make what they can be the best that they can be and let them evolve that. It is this collaboration of form and design and it's a collaboration between all the different artists that have to come together to make that all happen, um, that I do think the, that all that kind of reflects who we are as a pottery. I've decided um, that what I want, and I feel like it's reflected in the people that I hire are people that want to continue on and grow and create on a daily basis. It's not about making something and then resting on your laurels. It's about making, evolving, changing, and trusting that if you keep active with your mind and awareness of what's going on around you, that you will be successful in the designs if you work with the other people around you. And it feels like it's proven out to me that that's the right way to go because oftentimes I'm told that this is kind of such a unique situation. How is this working so well? And I feel like it has to be mostly because I trust in myself and others that it'll all work out. If you listen to other people and you leave your ego at the door and you all come in and you're not trying to climb the corporate ladder and you feel like you're trusting of the person that you're speaking with and you're talking to and you're collaborating with is trying to do right by the company just like you are, things work out. All right, I am on. Welcome everyone, thank you so much for spending a little bit of your evening with us here tonight. After that video, oh my goodness, I am so excited to talk with these guys again. Aren't you? All right, so the way that I would like to structure this is I'm gonna start asking them a couple of questions, but I really want this to be a dialogue with everyone in the room. So if you have a question, just raise your hand. I'm gonna to try to keep an eye on everyone upstairs, but uh, we're gonna to try to keep this going collaboratively, okay? So speaking of collaboratively, oh my goodness. So you have a, a studio full of artists, full of people passionate about pottery, about this business, about not making money. <laughs> But you do, you do make money and you're making a living. How, how is this possible? Well, the money question right out of the gate. <laughs> no glare here, that might have been a little too much. We're okay. Uh, so yeah, I think um, working, I worked at a pretty large pottery that had 150 employees prior to starting the pottery that I um, with Ephraim Pottery, and 
it was one of those things that you're working for a hourly wage or maybe a salary, depending on the position. And you weren't really asked too much about designs um, coming from you. It came from a design person. I think we had one or two people that would work on designs and that would be about it. And I recognized um, at that time that there are a lot of other people that had great ideas and great input and that could really help out. <clears throat> I also recognize that that's valuable. And if, if someone was to ask me for input, I would have more of a feeling of ownership in the place that I'm working. And so I took that in, into consideration um, when I started the new business and then I decided early on that it was not all about me and I felt like if people were giving it their all, I would definitely want to return uh, to them, you know, the benefits of, of the pottery as well. And I was also trying to create a, a situation where it was a, a place that was a good livelihood for people to work. And I, I didn't see how that was going to work unless I had buy-in. And buy-in comes from if we do well, we all do well. And if we don't do that well, we don't do all that well. And sure enough, um, it's a little bit of a carrot idea, but it's also just something that I feel like is more needed out in the world today. You know, I, I hear these reports of CEOs making 300 times the amount of the average worker or something like that per hour. And I just think it's kind of ridiculous. Um, and so I just wanted to make a place that I thought could survive and not uh, necessarily be turning over people as well. So I could go on and on and on, but that's, that's the start anyway. Yeah. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. <laughs> I could do this all night. Thank you so much for the video work that you did. Um, the people that came and did, you know, Ben, Joey, you know, Jason coming out to the pottery and, and really going through and taking the videos without us hardly even knowing you were there and um, doing such a great job. I was a little reluctant to have my voice going through that whole, whole thing, but you made me look as good as I can look. So <laughs> thank you so much. You did great. Yes, congratulations. Thank you very much, Ben Lunston. Um, so uh, I guess maybe backing up a little bit to perhaps where I should have started, but you are both potters, you're both interested in, in clay, and I'm interested in both of your stories because I know that they're a little bit different, how you got started specifically with pottery and, and why that was the, the medium that really sparked your interest, your passion. All right, so any juniors here? Any juniors? Aha, this next summer could be it for you. <laughs> you, you will find out what you will do forever. Uh, so between uh, my junior and senior year of college, uh, I got a job in my, well, close to my hometown in a pottery, just a shipping job, just something to make a few bucks in the summer. I, um, was going for an art degree and a business degree, so it kind of was something that had some appeal. And uh, it just so turned out I saw someone throwing a pot uh, kind of like your balcony area up here, and I was watching down onto this potter that was working on the wheel, and it seemed like a magic show. It was something out of this world, and I don't know that you would all have the same experience as I had, um, we're all different, different things spark us, but that sparked me. And I had to know what was going on there. I couldn't believe it. This, this potter was throwing what was called a batter bowl, but as a, as a bowl with a little spout on it. And he was throwing one every two minutes. And I just was like, this can't happen. This didn't make any sense to me. So that was kind of what really lit the fire. And then I went back to college my senior year and was in the art room all the time trying to figure out how to throw. Um, and it, it, the bug had bit me and I just had to kind of see where this was gonna take me. I went out into the business world for about a year, made a fair amount of money and was able to pay off my bills, my college bills, but 
I was in a situation where I wasn't loving what I was doing. I was not feeling good about what I was doing um, at the end of the day. So I went back to work for that pottery at kind of a low wage and worked my way through learning the different aspects of the pottery and then built it into a situation where I ended up starting Ephraim. And it was basically because that pottery was starting to fail after about seven years. It was a large pottery and it was kind of doing country craft and country craft, a lot of you people don't know country craft probably all that much uh, from a style, but um, it's crocks and jugs and, and things that you'd, butter churns, um, that kind of thing. And that was kind of going by the wayside and, and they weren't evolving. So I could see that I need to do, to do something and I ended up deciding that I needed to do it for myself. So started the business. Well, I came to pottery much, much later than Kevin. Um, I came to pottery because of Ephraim Pottery. I had been trying to be a painter, um, <laughs> or I was a painter. I had gone to school for art history, but I really loved painting. And I painted in before college, after college. I was um, making money by doing portrait paintings. and. Um, I had never taken a ceramics class, even in college or outside of college. And it just so happened that um, one day I coincidentally, I was on the bike trail biking and I got a flat tire and the person that stopped to help me was um, the studio foreman at Ephraim. And he t um, told me they were looking for an artist and that seemed very interesting to me. I, I had never honestly heard of a, a job that employed an artist. So <laughs> I, I, I figured out a way to go right in there. And, uh, and I talked to Kevin and sure enough, they were looking for someone um, with two dimensional painting skills to see how that would translate to ceramic art. So. Uh, there was a pretty big, long learning curve for me. And I would just, at first, I would just, <laughs> just come in every day for a couple hours. And I, they had me set up with these little tiles and some underglazes and um, overglazes. And I would just sit down and paint something and try to see how it would turn out. Um, right away at first, it was incredibly frustrating to me because uh, I was used to being able to see what I had at when I was done painting. So with oils, you, you kind of know what you've got going there. And with ceramics, you have to wait 24 hours for it to come out of the kiln. And that was, oh my God, excruciating. I'm not the most patient person, <laughs> but it's really turned out to be great. Like, I don't know, it just, it's its like this dopamine hit, opening those kilns every day, I just love it. So yeah, that's how I came to the pottery. That's really exciting. I, I do remember that thrill. I, I took um, two ceramics classes, so. <laughs> oh yeah. But when you actually open that kiln and you take your piece out and it hasn't exploded, oh, the thrill. The thrill. So, so you talked about um, having to wait and being frustrated when something didn't quite work out exactly the way you yeah. thought it might. And I mean, you took a leap from a, a steady job to starting something altogether. I mean, these are huge risks. And, and this is like business 101, right? Um, jumping off the end of the dock and hoping you don't either break your leg or drown. Um, <laughs> So can you speak to that, that, that risk-taking and, and, and how you go about navigating those fears, those frustrations? Sure, I think I can, I can speak to it, but I think it's hard to be in your 29-year-old mind when you jump off and you don't have a net, a safety net. But you also, kind of have to be, I was in, a, in the headspace that if I was going to do this, I had to give it a shot. And, and it wasn't my choice to when I needed to take that shot. Um, 
I could see the writing was on the wall. I went around and I uh, interviewed around the country to different pottery, potteries, and it wasn't so much that I couldn't get jobs in potteries. I had some offers for, for pottery jobs, but I couldn't see this as a career, as something that I could have a type of work that I'd be proud of at the end of the day, um, that I'd know that would be there year after year. And uh, I just had some ideas about maybe how to go about this and, and the work ethic needed to do it. And and I just need to give it a shot. I, I knew I could go into the private sector. I would proven to myself that I could sell things, even though I wasn't a good salesman. I was just like, numbers, I'll just, you know, you have to cold call so many places to get a sale, right? So um, I could do that. I could put in the hard work. And so I thought, if I can put the hard work in um, to making pottery, which I had become pretty proficient at, and finding a different market that was not country craft, but it was something that I felt like was on the rise. And there was um, a movement of um, revival arts and crafts, which is kind of the style of pottery that we, we work in. Uh, which is also something that has a lot of meaning to me because of there's a, like a lot of underlying uh, lying history to that that makes a lot of sense to me. All that kind of was lining up for me, and I could see a path. But to be honest with you, if I, it's kind of strange. I don't know if I would make the leap that I did without kind of being a little bit ignorant of certain things. And it's kind of like one of those things, like when you're young and you. Like I was crazy and I used to have a dirt bike and I'd go off jumps and stuff. I wouldn't do that now either, but when you're young and you don't have much to lose, um, you can kind of take some risks. And I think you got to go out there and maybe take some risks. You know, every time you do anything, you, um, you know, some art majors here, you're taking a risk. I think there's a lot of opportunity um, for creatives out there in this world. And creativity is just problem solving. So if you're a creative, you got a lot going for you anyway, so. Um, is there Anything to add? <laughs> Any talk of risk? Okay, okay. Any questions out here so far? We've got one way in the back. Yeah, yeah. So the question was just um, talking about the styles, um, a little bit about the pottery itself, the country style, and the the arts and crafts movements. All right. Well, I'll, I'll start out with the the country craft style. So that's not something that our pottery does. That's not what you're seeing here. But um, just to understand that a little bit more, um, thinking of you know how early American pottery was made. A lot of times it was made for utilitarian wear. Um, butter churns. These are things that people were buying these um, during the 70s, 80s, and 90s, 1970s, 80s, and 90s, as all but reproductions of pieces that were made well before that. I, I don't even really know the history of the time period. Um, it wasn't so much a historical... A house on the prairie yeah. Kind of things. Yeah, we're in Mankato, right? I mean, <laughs> what the <laughs> So yeah, when Little House was uh, going on. So yeah, there's these um, people that were storing um, storing things in crocks and jugs, and um, they they kind of were able to keep things cool and um, different ways of storage jars and that kind of thing. Um, some some of the things that were being made were plates, and of course there were coffee cups and all that type of thing. So there was that style, and that was. Salt glazed, uh, yeah, salt glazed with cobalt design. So it would be kind of a, a gray color and then it, they'd have a, a, a design on it that could be anything from a flower to a heart or, you know, it was very country. They had um, 
what do you call it, the little wallpaper kind of designs that they'd have? Stencils. Stencils, stencil designs. That was big in the 70s and 80s, and it, it kind of was going out of style kind of in the 90s. It was kind of had its day. And so this whole arts and crafts that I was speaking of, that's what we do. Um, now, that was a time period that basically was the eight, late 1800s, early 1900s. And that's coming right out of the Industrial Revolution. So the Industrial Revolution was the mid-1800s, and you have all these giant um, places making um, just machine-made everything and no windows and no eight-hour workdays. Um, these were long hours. These were sweatshops. These were people just cranking things out by the first industries that were able to mass produce items in the United States. So the human part of that was it was taking a toll on these people. And so these people were kind of, what do we want to do? We, we love to get out in our gardens. We love to grow flowers. We love to see the outdoors. They appreciate the outdoors more than ever after being in this place 14 hours a day or whatever it was. And so there are these little um, artisans that started out making, for, in pottery, it was um, a lot of designs with nature motifs on them. And they were oftentimes in these matte colors that we have here, so they don't have real high gloss glazes. Some of them were gloss, but a lot of them were matte. That was really highly sought after. Green was a really big color that they just wanted to bring green into their home, so the pottery would... Um, be nature inspired and have a lot of very natural color on it that would be brought into the home. So that time period was late 1800s, early um, early 1900s. That also came along with the style of um, architecture that were bungalow style homes, prairie style homes. Um, what? Yeah, craftsmen is another kind of version, I guess, craftsman style homes and. Um, those you'll find today, and it was a very strong, those are very well-built homes during that time, and you'll still find them in the, um, usually on small lots in the inner cities, oftentimes, or towns, um, kind of more down, downtown area, but they were on small lots, but they'd have a, a porch. And the thing that I loved about these, these buildings where the porches were there with a sidewalk in front of you and that wasn't much of a front yard but it was there for some flowers a, um, a sidewalk and your neighbors to be talking to while you're sitting on your porch it was just a different world and then that went out of style in place of larger properties um, that basically your neighbors weren't as close you had more privacy but you know it's always these these styles come and go and you like, ah, oh, maybe I'm a little too close to my neighbor. I'll move to this other area where I'm not as close. Then you kind of miss your neighbor. So you go back into the smaller homes. I mean, that's the, the trends just change because we, we evolve with, uh, with the times. But those homes were so well built and the craftsmanship was so, um, so important of that time that that's why there's still homes around from the late 1800s that are you know, just structurally as sound as can be. So, Thank you. I had a, a thought. It was going back to our video, and this might be for both of you, I'm not sure, but um, you talked about the Industrial Revolution and how it was just 14 hours pretty much in a sweatshop. Not so fun. People wanted to get out. They wanted to make things with their hands that were for them that were utility or beautiful. Um, we talked a little bit about your process and in the video, they mentioned that um, it's more than one person making a piece like this. Can you talk to us a little bit about your process, where the idea originates, how it develops, how it actually comes into fruition? Um, we approach our process in different ways. Oftentimes, it starts with a general discussion with everyone in the studio, including people who work in the office. We're all part of a big meeting, um, and we brainstorm together to think of ideas. And then we 
kind of bat those ideas back and forth. We talk about how we would make them. Um, I, usually it starts with the idea of of motif or it can start this way. So we'll say, oh, you know, I'd like to see a koi. I'm looking at that koi pot right now, a koi on a, on a vase. Like, have we, you know, what could we do with that? What, what kind of form would look good with that? And someone will chime in, oh, what if we did it like this? And, and then it, and then somebody else, the sculptor will chime in and say, oh yeah, I could, yeah, I could pos I could I could do something like that. I have an idea for that. And so anyway, we ha we discuss all these different ideas and and then we sort of break up and and make those things. Um we make a bunch of trials so the the uh, potters will throw a bunch of different forms in consultation with the glazers and the sculptors and then we'll make experimental pieces of with these different ideas on them um, and then they go into the glazing department the glazers try different glazes on them and then we come together again and um, d discuss the pieces um, and decide which ones we like and and what the advantages of each piece is we really have to make sure that we consider repeatability because we are making these pieces in runs um, so that's a that's a key consideration so talking about money again <laughs> so it has to be made we ask each person okay how long is it going to take you to make this and I guess that's one of the things to consider if you're a student you're thinking okay I might be able to do something like this and make something that's going to go out there into the world. And so we kind of have a dollar an hour rate. So if a, um, a piece is going to um, take us, you know, 40 minutes, it's, you know, we, we basically know per minute, per hour, um, how much we need to make for that. And then if we can make it in that amount of time in a reasonable way, then we will go ahead with it. Um, another thing I wanted to point out is in the middle back, of the area. I know it's, it might be something that you can look at um, afterwards. There's several pots that are similar to one another. Um, it's, it's a peacock feather, and it was a, a piece that has several drawings that we did um, in development, or Matt actually did. Uh, Matt Dries was the artist that did a lot of the drawings. And then there's so many iterations of that pot before we came to the final piece that then is going to be put into next year's catalog. So that's a little bit of the process by looking at the forms that we have how and how they all um, kind of evolved. Fascinating process. Now, how many are on staff at Ephraim right now? Artists. artists. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> so we have uh, 10 artists on staff that are working um, in the ceramic area, and then we have a woodworker that um, makes frames for us, and I consider him. Oh, is it nine plus John? Okay, I guess we include John as the tenth. I'm sorry. What about Tanner? Okay, sorry. We just hired someone, so yeah. So ten artists, and that's kind of that's another whole trick because I'm not trying to grow the business, which is business 101. What you don't do is create something that you are not going to expand and expand and expand and sell for millions of dollars. I'm trying to maintain it. And fortunately, it's working out pretty good. So um, we've had one layoff, and that was for COVID throughout the years. But other than that, we've had stable jobs for 27 years. So That's impressive for any business, <laughs> for sure. So my next question is a bit of a two-part question. So we have uh, 10 artists, 9 plus 1. Um, on the business side, is there another set of individuals that are full-time employed? So, yeah, we have several people in charge of keeping us organized and helping sell our products. And so there's 
the whole business cycle. You're you're making a product, but you're also marketing it. You're selling it. And we have two stores. We have one store in our hometown, Lake Mills, just a very small, modest store. And then we have a store in California. And the California store has one full-time person, and then they have one part-time, well, one regular part-time person, and then we have a couple others that will help us out in a pinch kind of thing. Um, we have three main office people in the Lake Mills area that um, have a range of things that they do. Um, helping out in shipping, marketing, photography, um, accounting, customer service, uh, all the social media, just everything, designing, making catalogs. Um, and it's not quite that simple. Leah is also involved with some of that as well. She helps out with some of the marketing and photography. Um, you wear a lot of different hats, but um, that's, it's, Kind of a clean break, but not that clean. That sounds very liberal arts. <laughs> so uh, the second part of that question, yeah, you get this. The second part of that question, you had mentioned that you're trying to keep it small, and that's a big no-no for Business 101. I heard that there's a story here about someone who wanted to make you very big. Do you want to go into that story? with that company sure. called Disney? Yeah. Um, so yeah, there are some challenges along the way because when you make a product and somebody like a Disney will show you some interest, uh, you're flattered by that and you see the dollar signs because they can throw a lot of orders your way. And um, so early on, um, I worked with Disney for a while, and everything was going fine. Then they started um, wanting some custom pieces. Um, they're, they're making a place called the Disney Grand Hotel in California, and they wanted some custom big pieces and all this. And, and I, that was fine. And so we went through several iterations um, of designing pieces for them that were one of a kind pieces and we weren't charging them for the design work or anything. Uh, but every time I'd contact them, it would be a different person in charge of the project and I'd have to start over from scratch. And they were just becoming difficult to the point where it was just being becoming hard, harder and harder to work and make money um, doing what they wanted. They did order, um, say they wanted to order a bunch of pieces from us and that kind of kept on falling apart and they'd reorder, the next person would reorder. So these orders were ordered and then canceled and reordered. And um, finally, I just got to the point where I said that I was done. And I said, sorry, you can't order from here. And Disney doesn't like to hear that they can't, you can't order from here, but no, it doesn't matter. Um, so um, they came to, we had a show um, at the Disney Grand Hotel a couple years later, and um, some buyers from Disney came in. They asked if they could buy things. And at the time, originally, I was going to be selling um, all these pieces to them at wholesale. So the whole business idea is like you sell to a store at half price, and then they mark it up. So they, you sell to them for 100 bucks, they sell it for 200 bucks. And um, I'm like, sorry, I can't sell to you, you know, at wholesale. And they said, that's okay. And they just bought the rest of my booth for full price, which was ridiculous, but I just won't sell to them wholesale. Uh, but you have to be careful because if I would have gone ahead and had Disney ordering hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, and then Disney says, no, we're done, you know, with your product it scared me that I could be owned by Disney to a certain degree and then all of a sudden, if they said no, then I have all these workers that needed to have jobs and I wouldn't have the work for them. So that initial exchange, I think, served me well with a lot of the different larger companies that have come in and talked to us about doing things. It's not immediately like you're flattered and I'm gonna do anything for you. It's, I'm flattered, but here, 
are our parameters as well and have respect for yourself and your process. And um, there's, there's a lot more to it, but that's the general bones. Yeah. Wonderful, that is a fascinating answer. I like that a lot. I wanna open it up to the audience as well. Yes, sir. Um, I know it's not necessarily about poverty, but I wanted to hear about Leah's backstory with painting, specifically back on portrait painting. Yes, Leah's backstory on painting and specifically portrait painting. Sure, uh, I really loved, I discovered oil painting in high school and I was, really wanted to get to be good at oil painting and I didn't know how to do that. So when I went to college, I wanted to go to an art school and my dad, um, I don't know if you heard this when you were at the studio, my dad looked at the, the I got into this art school in New York and I, um, I had to submit a portfolio and I was all happy and, and I gave him the catalog that came in the mail of classes and they had um, one math class. It was math for gallery owners. And he was like, oh my God, I'm not paying this much money for that. And uh, so I went to Madison, in UW-Madison, University of Wisconsin-Madison. <laughs> I forgot we're not in Wisconsin. Um, <laughs> and I thought I would take art classes there. So first thing I freshman year I go to the painting professor and I was like can I get into your intermediate painting class and I got into this class and I don't know I just there was no like it didn't give me the instruction that I was looking for and I did not like it and then the next semester I took the next painting class and the first assignment was to like make a cartoon, which just wasn't my thing. Like that's just not what I wanted from it. Um, I wanted like technical teaching. So then I went over to the art history department. It was at Madison, it's right next door to the art building. And I thought, well, you know, maybe if I take some of these classes where they're teaching about painters that could paint like I wanted to paint. Maybe I could just sort of learn that through that way. And that sort of spun me off in a really different direction. Um, that was more writing papers and um, learning about art. And I really, really liked that. I got, I got sort of drawn into that. I got a master's degree in art history um, with a focus on the Italian Renaissance and um, then I, we moved away from Madison because my husband got a job and um, I had some kids and I was still painting and trying to learn how to, how to do, how to paint better. And actually though I was, so I'm kind of a self-taught painter in a way, but I did take a class and I don't know, I kind of, I'm not sure she still teaches, but maybe some people around here would have learned from her. I took a class with Peggy Baumgartner in La Crosse, which isn't too far away, which was fantastic. Like more than anything else, that helped me understand how to paint better. Um, so um, yeah, that, that was what I was doing when I um, got my flat tire on the bike trail. <laughs> I haven't painted much since I started working at Ephraim, or painted much with oil paints, a little bit, but I've been mostly um, working on ceramics now. Yes, sir. <laughs> there are definitely aggravations um and there are times when you know like when you're on a really long flight and you are 
like you just want to get off that airplane, but it's not landed yet. Like you're coming from Europe or something. <laughs> and there are times when like there's all these pots lined up and I'm like, I am going to get done with all these pots today. And in order to get done with all those pots, like you pretty much can't move. Like you can't like you've got to like have staying power and focus to get them done. And th but at the same time, that's kind of fun and you get this sense of accomplishment from that and it's not every day that's like that. And the other thing to answer your question is like, there is, seriously is never a day where I get, like my kids are like, oh, I've got the Sunday scaries. Like, no, on Monday I am like ready to get back to work and there really isn't a day where I don't want to be in there. We're all friends there and it's just a really great, group of people so yeah even when you're stuck to your chair sculpting the same flower over and over again you're joking around with people and it's fun at the same it really is the best job so I hope that I didn't see you bad there. <laughs> let me straighten a few things out <clears throat> so no I, all that's true and but to understand our our jobs a little bit better when we have the numbers on these pieces that we've made there might be 150 of that piece made but i'll get a work order and i'll be making five of that piece this week five in two weeks you know 10 three weeks from then you know it's it's spread out generally there are times that we'll have larger runs when we're getting ready to do a new catalog for instance and we need to fill our gallery in wisconsin with have, to have maybe a few pieces so they have an individual piece there and then a couple backups and then the same thing in California. And depending on what kind of piece it is, it might come in um, three different colors. So now you need three times three, that's nine. And that's two different galleries, that's 18. And so now you're doing a run of 18. That might be a pretty large run unless sometimes tile, you might do a little bit more, but not too often do, are we doing more than it's usually a run of between three and eight, something like that. And then at certain times we might do more. So, um, but I get exactly what, um, you know, Leah's saying and Leah has that kind of drive that she just wants to make, sh she always likes to clear the decks. And so I'm gonna sit down and I'm just gonna do this. And once she gets her mind on something, it's not always, it's kind of self-imposed in a way. Yeah. There's not so much of a deadline like, you sit in that chair, no bathroom breaks or anything like that. It's like until you, you can't leave. Um, so it's, it's not that way, but you know, we do have to be diligent because, um, because we're all in this together and it is, um, we share all the profits with the employees, we all kind of, hey, you know, stick around, help us make a few more bucks, you know, or we have this bigger job to get done. Let's all pitch in and help and make that happen. And there's, there's some, and um, Leah's one of them who's definitely gonna be there for you when you're in a pinch. Yes. Tell us more about why California, why have a gallery there, and how did that all come about? Why California? Great question. Um, so when we were doing, we do a lot of shows and that were um, evolved or revolved around the arts and crafts movement. There were specific shows, um, so we wouldn't do just the uh, the Mankato art show. We would go to a show wherever it was in the country that was focused on the arts and crafts movement. So when people walked in the door, they had an idea of what they were looking at. So we weren't just kind of like, okay, what kind of art do you make? No, they knew what we were. Uh, what we were about. Several of those shows were in California when we started out. It seems trends start on the coast and kind of come to the Midwest a little bit later. Um, but we started out, there were lots of shows available to us in California right away in 1997, 96, 97. I started um, the business in 96, but we really didn't get doing shows until 97. Um, and so I do two Pasadena shows, um, a San Francisco show. We've done Glendale. I, there's different shows. You don't need to know all of them. Um, but there were plenty of shows out there, and we had a, a market that was kind of what 
quite extensive and it's a large state, a huge economy. So shows were kind of on the way down as the whole age of the um, buying online um, started to becoming a thing. We basically stopped doing shows in 2016, but I knew shows were probably gonna be leaving us uh, 2008, 2009, during that recession, they were kind of, you could see the writing was on the wall for some of these shows. So at the time I had a, a potter that was from Sacramento and uh, he had worked for a pottery in Sacramento that started a, a pottery in the central coast of California. And he said once they, um, actually they started a store in the central coast of California, they were, I think it was out of, um, I think that was out of Sacramento that he, they made the pots. But once they opened up that store, they kind of went gangbusters. And he said, you should look into this. We should, you know, if we're not going to be doing uh, shows forever out here, maybe we could have an ongoing presence. And I thought that idea was just ridiculous because I thought, how can I afford a store in California and the workers and all that kind of thing. But on a whim, I decided I'd start looking into it. And um, there's a small, um, a small town, 6,000 people in, uh, in the, right on the coast of California called Cambria. And it's an art focused town. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of it, but the Hearst Castle, for older people, you might know the Hearst Castle story. Um, very interesting story, by the way. And that Hearst Castle is right just north of it a few miles. And so that's, there's a lot of art. Um, it was an art collector that was a newsman that collected all this art and they give tours to this place all the time now. It's just gigantic. Um, and so there's people coming for these tours and then there's this cute town that has all these galleries in it. And I decided to look at how much galleries would cost to rent and, um, what a store manager would be like and all that kind of stuff. And turned out it wasn't gonna cost me any more than it was in Lake Mills, Wisconsin. And so that had me kind of intrigued. And there is another moment where I jumped off the cliff and uh, into California. And it, it's just, it's kind of like a second home to me now. And I love it out there. Um, it's, it's a different world and we've learned a lot through that experience and and it's done really well for us. So did that answer your question? Yeah. Great. I want to check the time. How are we doing on time? Getting close. Getting close. One more question. Phil. Uh, so you've been producing and creating a product uh, for over two decades now. How do you maintain creativity in the Creating for over two decades, how do you maintain creativity? Yeah, that's a really good question because you kind of feel like it might just dry up one day and you just don't have it. Um, and to be honest with you, the story of Leah was a little bit incomplete um, because she was talking about herself. Uh, and I think trying to understand like, what I needed from someone was I needed a creative spark at that time. So this was 2012, 11 or 12 <laughs> that Leah started with me. But um, what I saw in her portraits was not arts and crafts, but it was, it was just it. You know, you, it was undeniable the ability and the style. I mean, a portrait, you can paint someone looking just like the picture, but it's, it's something about it. And the gallery that I saw her work in, it just stood out from everything else. And then I wanted to meet this person. It just so happened by coincidence, we ended up meeting not long after that because she got a flat tire in the bike trail. Anyway, um, so I guess the influx of new blood and then I think it helps a lot. And I think collaboration is key. I can't do this on my own. I really just, the designs and, and it's strange that we're, 
we were sitting at a coffee shop. We had some extra time. We came a day early because we had some snow in Wisconsin. We were worried about where we're going to make it. So we came a day early and we sat in a coffee shop today and we we're sitting there designing pots. Um, it's just what we do. And we talk about it all the time. And, and then when a new person comes in, it seems like, wow, they, they thought of something I never would have. And then we start going down a vein of in a different direction. And I think that not trying to do it all on your own works really well for us. I know I would have not gotten anywhere near 27 years with just my own designs. So I'm really thankful every day that I get to wake up and create, I guess this is another thing, that classroom deal that you guys got going on every day that you might not appreciate as much as you should is something you'll yearn for down the road. Like, oh, if I could just be back in the art, art room making. And that's what we've tried to create here. We've tried to create the art room that is a business. And we all kind of are in it together. And it's a little unwieldy sometimes, but for the most part, we've muddled through and, and it, it's, worked, it's worked really well for us. And I think it could be a, um, something that we hope someone else would maybe try and emulate in whatever art form that they would do. Because I think all the, um, the artists that are working individually that is a thing now. It hasn't always been that. There have been artist guilds in the past and having that come around again works well for certain kinds of people. It just happened to be that it worked out really well for Leah and myself. And uh, that's why you kind of have Ephraim as the name and, and then the artists are noted on the bottom, but um, it's not all about the individuals. It's about the collaboration and I think the other thing is I think we all just kind of do better when we listen and we work together. And I feel like that whole message is something that this country is sadly missing. And if we could do that in our own little building, um, I feel like it's a start. So. Thank you so much. I think on behalf of everyone in this room, I can safely say thank you for your work your passion, and your inspiration. Thank you very much. Okay, some closing thoughts. Um, I just put a tag out on a pedestal with and there's no piece there. That's because it's in a box back here. Um, after we clear the gallery, after we clear the chairs, and uh, you know, you're carrying your little plate with grapes on it, um, we'll do an unboxing. Okay, so there's, there's a piece here that, that just arrived. We're, uh, we used it on all our promotional material, and I, I kind of messed up. I, I realized afterwards it's not actually on the list that they said they were gonna bring, but it's so cool. Okay, so come back to see that. Also, um, I'm holding more things than I can handle here, Denise. Um, <clears throat> so this uh, may have been handed to you. These are, these are for you to have. Um, this is the most recent catalog, but they're working on the next catalog. Uh, they've also brought an archive of catalogs for, for us to browse uh, today or for the duration of the show. They need those back. So uh, the 2022 catalog you can have, all the others we need to leave here. Um, you're doing great. Go ahead. Um, so if you would like to get one of these catalogs in the mail, you can sign up on our website. There's a button you can push at the bottom that says, I want a catalog. And then the other thing, though, is every Tuesday morning at 8 a.m., we release a new design that's only available to buy for one week. But if you get on our email list, we'll email you that design and you might be interested to see like what we come up with every week because sometimes it's weird and sometimes <laughs> it's fun and it's a little little something new in your inbox every Tuesday. That's the pot of the week, right? That's, it. That's very exciting. It's very exciting. Denise, you're doing great. Okay, so I've got a couple random picks here. Um, 
uh, A Single Shard and How to Do Nothing, Resisting the Attention Economy. Uh, these are books that are uh, carefully curated and um, hauled through the ice and snow from, uh, from the library. Emily's in the back there and you can check out a book from the library during the duration of tonight's reception. Also, I've been asked to announce that uh, there's a wellness practices event, uh, February 13th, Hunsey Hall Southern Lantern. Um, Dr. Coles and others from, um, uh, what do we call it? Cl clinical mental health uh, area, counseling area, um, will be talking about cultivating resilience, wellness practices, being intentional with your well-being and the indivisible self. Um, I'm very happy <laughs> right now. I think this was, this was really fun. Uh, part of that comes from collaboration. There's, there's such a big team. Uh, ben Fogstead's about to get back on the guitar. He was plucking the strings beforehand and will do the same for you afterwards. He's very generous, as uh, is Ben Lunston, and uh, Solvay's about to feed you. And there's just so many people who uh, make make this happen. So thank you very much. We have our own collaboration going here. Let's have another round of applause for our guests. <laughs>